Hi, good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name's Louise Walsh and I'm delighted to be a board member of the St Vincent's Current Foundation and my day job is the CEO of the Future Generation Companies, which are big funders in youth mental health. COVID-19 has completely disrupted the way we live, the way we socialise and generally the way we operate. And in Australia, the, the implementation of tough social distancing measures has successfully curbed the spread of the disease, thank goodness. As fewer and fewer cases are being diagnosed in Australia, we're slowly heading back to pre-COVID way of life, thank goodness. While the physical threat of the pandemic uh, is declining in Australia, the impact of COVID-19, of course, on our mental health is rising and has risen dramatically over the last three months and will continue well into the future. I'm delighted today to be joined by two of our mental health experts at St Vincent's. Uh, firstly, Professor Elizabeth Scott, or Liz, uh, who's the clinical director of the Young Adult Mental Health Unit at St Vincent's Private Hospital. And secondly, Dr Mike, Michael uh, Millard, a consultant psychiatrist at St Vincent's Public Hospital. Uh, Mike specialises in adult mood and anxiety conditions in particular. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, Mike and Liz. It's fantastic to, to have you here today. And of course, you know, normally when you're doing these sessions, you might have a nice you know, vase of flowers. I mean, isn't it interesting um, with COVID how we've got hand sanitizer as our, as our main prop. So, and of course we're recognizing social distancing. So thank you. So just to kickstart the discussion, I mean, firstly, uh, Mike, Isolation is always challenging for us. And as social uh, beings, most of us generally experience increased levels of anxiety or depression that are associated with the interruption to routine, the perceived loss of control um, that exerts over our own lives. Would you discuss the psychological effects of these principles in relation to COVID? Absolutely. Uh, well, I think the first thing that I have to say is that uh, we all recognise that we've been going through this remarkable period of unprecedented change. Uh, and in that context, it's absolutely normal to be experiencing anxiety. Um, however, that said, for a lot of us, the anxiety has been overwhelming and quite debilitating. And it's really around that uh, the two notions of the combination of the uncertainty and the speed of change that's been particularly toxic, uh, particularly toxic for us. I throw into that mix that our main defence against this virus has been to be physically distant. And we know that isolation causes increased levels of anxiety, depression, loneliness, boredom, and of course we've seen an increase in domestic violence. Um, that said, as well, we're laying that on top of the fact that for a sizable proportion of our community, they've already been experiencing debilitating levels of anxiety and depression um, uh, as well prior to the, the added levels of distress that the pandemic's been causing. Uh, I like to think that it, it, it's really we're in, the, in two epidemics or two pandemics and we really have to be working to flatten both curves. It's a mental health one and of course a physical pandemic. And the other thing that I think is that we really need to focus on the fact that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Mm, I think because it's, it's interesting, you know, I think there's some people out there that probably think in some cases the worst is over or, you know, the health crisis may be, you know, lifting. But of course, we've got this economic impact as yes. well. And, and that worries me even more from the mental health issues with, you know, loss of jobs, etc. Absolutely. I think that we're generally seeing these waves. So the first wave was, of course, the, the, the initial panic and the fear that went through the community over the last couple of months. But now we're going to see a whole series of people that haven't had to deal with a particular level of stress or worry that are, are going to continue to struggle with mental health concerns in the context of losing their jobs or financial security. We're also going to see people who have chronic mental health conditions that have delayed coming into services or haven't been to see their GPs or regular services or regular counsellors uh, that have been holding on essentially. And I think that if people aren't accessing their routine supports, they can only hold on for so long. So these are the sorts of things that we're thinking about in terms of what the next coming months are going to be looking like. Mm, thank you. 
And Liz, I mean, adolescence, of course, is a period of great change um, for all young people and, and can entail a range of you know, challenges, of course, whether they're social, economic, academic. And at the best of times, our, our young people experience um, you know, higher than average rates of, of unemployment. I mean, as these economic impacts of COVID um, begin to take hold, young people, of course, are going to be adversely affected. I mean, what impact is COVID specifically having on the mental health of young people? So it's a very good question. And all the things that Mike has really described, if you think about it, are really um, highlighted in young people. So for young people, employment, education are vital. These are the times where they are stepping out onto the, their ladder that will take them to the future. So if you lose your footing on that ladder, the risk of being of falling down and finding it very hard to get yourself back up again is very high. It's also the time in your life and your brain development when the major mental health disorders arise. So m the majority of major mental health disorders that we see in adulthood will arise between from puberty onwards to the age of 25. So these are really vulnerable periods of time. And social, you know, social connection and social dislocation are very relevant to young people. So I want to say what we do know. So we know from past pandemics and recessions that young people are specifically affected. So we know from looking at countries following the global uh, financial crisis in 2008 that there were very high rates of mental health problems, drug and alcohol problems and suicide rates increased over that period of time followed the global financial crisis and made worse in a lot of countries by austerity measures that were put in place that then made it much harder for young people to actually get back into education and employment. We also have good modelling about what is likely to happen in Australia. We have, as you know, we say, kind of dodged the bullet in terms of COVID. We think that the actual infection rates are low, but I agree with Mike that we are likely to see this second wave, this kind of rise in mental health problems. And we know from modelling both overseas and in Australia, and in particular regions of Australia, that changes to employment, so higher rates of youth unemployment and social dislocation, and often those, from those communities in rural or regional areas that comes on the back of drought or bushfires or other really serious social issues, we're going to see changes in the presentations of mental health problems in those communities, particularly in young people and in those marginalised in those communities. So we expect to see higher rates of distress, anxiety, depression, drug and alcohol problems, more serious mental health problems, suicide and other kind of serious kind of social issues. So it's going to be a major crisis and it's going to occur in those areas of the country that are already suffering and have limited resources to cope. Mm. I think, you know, it's interesting, my mother, who's, who happens to be an alumni of, of St Vincent's, you know, she's 86 now and lives on the south coast, but she was saying to me recently, you know, my generation, our generation, millennials, even younger, you know, we've never lived through any hardship. Mm. You know, the GFC in Australia was really not that severe when no. you think about places mm. like the UK or Europe. And, um, you know, she said, she said, you know, I, I am seriously very concerned because you've never lived through hardship. You know, she said, I've lived through, um, you know, potato rations and everything else with, you know, the Second World War. And I think that that's the worrying thing, particularly for young people, because we've had it so good. You know, it's yes. been on a plate, you know, let's face it. So, so we've just, I mean, we've just come back from working in the northern north coast of New South Wales, where they have very high rates of youth suicide. So they have 40 percent over the national average. So they are already starting from a from a community that is really struggling. So it's it, you know, it's a real worry that we we need to put in place the type of measures that we've seen with COVID into these communities to do exactly the same that we have with COVID to prevent the deaths and the, you know, the social consequences of, of the crisis that we've been facing. Mm. And Liz, just talking about, you touched on it before, the levels of alcohol consumption. Yes. Because I do know from just talking to friends, it's very interesting that it seems to have gone up <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, during this period of isolation when people sort of really fess up to what they've been doing. But can we talk about the impact of that on young people in particular? How do you see that issue? Yeah, so I think it I kind of works in two ways. If young people see their parents drinking or, you know, see drug use associated with 
that's very influential. So we know that with smoking and with cannabis, that how parents behave is very influential on young people and young people's habits. So I think that's one thing. And, and alcohol has tended to be a coping strategy in Australia when times get tough. People tend to drink more. Previously, they were going to the pub. Now, I think they kind of drink at home. In other countries like America, you see gun sales go up. I mean, we're mm. very lucky in Australia that we have coping, different coping strategies. But even so, there is harm associated with some of those. And the other things, the other ways that young people also cope is by using drugs and alcohol. Mm. And particularly those young people who become isolated or marginalized or disconnected from you know, those social networks, they're much more likely to use drugs and alcohol than as a coping strategy. So we have seen increased rates of drug and alcohol use and all the social consequences that are associated with that. And it's very hard in our fragmented health system to actually put the mental health, the social, the drug and alcohol problems together for people to get the kind of help that they need across all of those areas. We still have very fragmented services which make it very difficult for people to access help. And there's often a lot of barriers to, to getting help. The good thing about telehealth and digital health is that people can now do that much more anonymously from their own home without necessarily having to go to a service. So we have the opportunity to actually provide much better care to people when they need it. Mm. Well, look, we will come back and talk about um, the tele-digital health because I'm particularly interested in that. But before we do that, Mike, um, we've just heard you know, a little bit there from Liz about young people. Can we talk about the fact that older people are just as vulnerable? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a perfect storm, really, isn't it, COVID, for, for mental distress for, for older people, you know, with the isolation. I know in the case of my mother, you know, she's living independently in an aged care facility, 86. The loneliness has mm. been extraordinary. Mm. Um, and she's probably one of the more lucky ones that she's living independently. But can you share with us um, how COVID is affecting the mental health of older Australians. And I'm sure some of those are, mm. are actually listening and watching to us today. Oh, ab absolutely. I'm, I mean, it's, it's all of the things that we've been talking about and more so really in the context of the fact that the serious harms with COVID are exponentially higher as we get older and have, uh, you know, comor comorbid medical conditions. Uh, so I, I couch it in the fact that social isolation and loneliness was probably one of our biggest problems for older, older Australians prior mm. to this epidemic coming along. And uh, it, it's, it's completely compounded that for, uh, for a large proportion of our society. Uh, to the extent, of course, where uh, aged care homes were completely excluding family uh, and, and visitors um, uh, understandably so, c considering that the, a lot of the outbreaks that Australia's had has been devastating in, in aged care facilities. Uh, it's also meant, though, that people are frightened of accessing their usual supports. People have been frightened of seeing their family members, and family members have been frightened of the risk of increasing the risk to their mm. older loved ones. Mm. Um, I also say that we've horrifyingly been through a period where people have been uh, unable to access some of their most basic needs. I think that the panic buying was a terrific example of that where uh, there, there were photographs of people who just were completely standing in front of bare shelves unable to access toilet paper. It's really quite heartbreaking. Uh, some of the things that, that have happened and they've been very distressing uh, for people to be experiencing across the community. Mm. I say that as well that um, with the increased stress about financial certainty, the uncertainty of the future has led to you know changes in sleep sleep wake cycle. We've had increased low grades of inflammation as a result of this, and increased levels of depression. All of which we know affect older people in more significant ways. Mm. Um, I do couch that though saying that our older people are immensely resilient uh, because of some of their life experiences. So mm. I'm very respectful for the comment that you made earlier uh, from your mother. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And look, Liz, it'd probably be remiss of us not to to talk a bit about the bushfires and the impact of that, because of course we can get swept up in the, the pan pandemic. But if you think about the, the end of last year and the start of this year, you know, it was horrific, the impact of, of the bushfires. We've not seen bushfires like that. I mean, I, we have a place on the South Coast, so we were, you know, they were 10 kilometres away from us. And um, there's no question there was impact there. Can you uh, 
talk a little bit about that that long term impact of of that in itself, um, and and also the rural and regional um, aspect of this as well would be interesting. Yeah, so again, just from um, our visit to the North Coast recently to work with a kind of local health district there, they were saying that their bushfire started in August last year. Wow. So it's almost 12 months of, 12 months of serious kind of, you know, disruption and kind of difficulty that they've experienced. And we know from um, bushfires, from the um, other bushfires in Victoria, that the rates of mental health distress in the community go up. So distress, anxiety, depression, and also, you know, post-traumatic stress symptoms um, increase in those communities. And it's been, we've had government initiatives that have provided additional support, and Mike probably would, might comment on this, but it's been very hard in rural and regional areas because of issues of workforce, and because of poorly coordinated care, poorly integrated care, to actually use that money effectively to, to benefit people. So, a lot of that money sadly has not been really able to be you know, spent for the benefit of the community. So again, there's an opportunity now, I think, to think mm. about how to coordinate care better. So I don't know if you want to comment, Mike, mm. about what be things great, Mike. No, Yeah, look, I absolutely agree. Uh, look, I, I mean, from a personal level, and I just sort of think about St Vincent's response to uh, uh, the bushfires earlier this year, um, which I was privileged to be part of, uh, they, they sent down a, a small team uh, to provide emergency mental health support, uh, immediate relief down to the south coast, which was one of the mo most severely affected areas. Uh, and this was to provide respite to the local teams because if you think about it, they were trying to provide care for their community whilst mm. they were also trying to you know, uh, manage the fact that they also had lost their houses and, mm. and, uh, and, uh, and were going through significant distress. And it really provided me with an opportunity to get uh, a unique first-hand experience and I guess bear witness to the trauma that happened down on the south coast. Uh, and it was a very humbling e experience. Um, so coming back from that, and, uh, and I guess sort of Liz has touched on the power of, I, I guess, um, what we do here in, in terms of digital interventions and telehealth, we were able to come back, take what, you know, what the team learned from being down actually on the ground uh, and work on, uh, I guess, thinking through a service to be able to support rural and remote communities to be able to treat uh, and to look after their communities uh, using some of the tools that we develop and use, certainly here. Um, so uh, I, I think there's another parallel, and Liz touched on it, uh, between the, what the bushfire experience and the pandemic is that uh, when I went down there and I spoke to people, it, they said to me, look, this isn't like the earthquake. It mm. wasn't one event no. that we had and then everyone comes in and then we recover. We work on recovering. Um, it was an ongoing event. And if we're talking about, that was recurrent trauma from August. And people were saying, every time I smell a grass fire, I have this, this panic attack that it's back, it's back. Mm. And that's actually what we're experiencing at the moment with this pandemic. Mm. I mean, the parallels are very close. If just the way we think about uh, you know the effect that that has on our mental health and well-being, and this, uh, you know, the, the the fear that sort of sits just beneath the community as we start to move into these different phases of recovery, if we want to call it that. Mm. And Liz, just on the digital technologies as well, because, yes. you know, St Vincent's is to be applauded for some of the amazing work it's done in heart lung, um, robotics. I mean, I've all, you know, being, you know, coming onto the board two years ago, you really start to understand and learn this you don't realize how first class it is before that but surely this is a, a tipping point for this for these hospitals in regard to mental health as well i mean there must be a real opportunity here to take a leadership role how will it affect what you do in your role so I'm, I'm really glad you raised that. And I think some of the work that Kruf had been doing led with Mike's leadership is, is first class work and is really world leading. And that's coupled with a lot of the work that we've been doing through the University of Sydney, developing kind of digital platforms that really provide integrated care for communities, particularly for areas where there is, uh, there is workforce issues. So it really is an opportunity and digital health Digital transformation is the opportunity to actually reform our healthcare system to get better care for everybody. 
is not just about rural and regional areas, it is about all of us, it is about everybody and it particularly relates to chronic health problems mm -hmm. of which mental health is a, a great example of that. Yep. Other areas like cardiovascular medicine um, and diabetes are similar where we have the opportunity because of the crisis to actually do things differently. We have seen a rapid transformation into telehealth. It would have taken years to do that if we tried to negotiate that with health systems. We've done it really rapidly and very successfully and we hope there is no going back from that. But the other opportunity is to put these very more sophisticated digital health um, systems in place that allow us to provide access to good quality care to everybody, everywhere, when they need it, and to be able to track the outcomes of that from an economic point of view, to be able to see whether the interventions, the resources that we put in place are actually providing the outcomes that we need. Yep. And we've been, we really have not been able to do that in Australia, so we've really lagged behind. We have the opportunity to do modelling, to do provide data modelling that shows the areas that need resources, what kind of resources they need. If you put those resources in, will you prevent deaths? What will your outcomes be? And to test out those models in real time. So mm. it is a great opportunity and I hope it will be matched by government investment. Now, so just taking up on that point about government investment, so what do you think on that point, Mike? Because, I mean, with my day job, I mean, I, yeah. you know, we had Christine Morgan in recently, the chairman of the National Mental Health Commission, talking about all the different packages that the government has done. So are we going to see the serious change and the reform that we need? Because, you know, we can, there can be a whole lot of rhetoric in this space yes. and repackaging of, you know, old Absolutely. money, as we know from governments. I mean, are we seriously going to see that change? Well... What, well, I have to say I seriously hope so, to, <laughs> to start with. Um, but I think to pick up on a couple of things that Liz has said, uh, I, I think that um, there's this idea that online interventions might be second best in some way, or mm. that's just for rural and remote communities, whereas in the big city we can have access to all the bells and whistles. Well, actually, that's not the case in the sense these aren't second class interventions. They, they are actually should be the standard of care across the community. Mm. Uh, it shouldn't matter whether you're in Burwood or Bermagui. Um, we are actually able to provide excellent care that's evidence-based, that's proven to work uh, uh, across the board. And I think that that's an amazing thing to be able to, to say. Uh, the service that St Vincent's has, which is this way up, which is, which is where I am, uh, we, we've been developing these programs since 2011. Uh, they're based on the fact that they're evidence-based programs that treat mental health conditions and help people to manage their well-being. So we want to teach people the skills to be able to maintain their own well-being. Um, and uh, uh, the, what we do, uh, we've proven to work through, uh, I guess this is where we talk about uh, evidence-based care and, and measuring what we're doing. So when we say that something works, that we know it works. Uh, and that's been done through, you know, it's 32 randomised control trials. And that's the sort of scientific conditions that medications are, you know, tested and, uh, and proven to work in. So when we say that something works, we know it does. And then we use the technology to help to be able to monitor and to be able to show people, so people are able to track their progress through our courses. And we see the data coming in all the time that show that they're effective. So the idea that, that they're not, it's not good care for everyone is, is not true. So yeah. it's, it's very important. Mm. Well, thank you. And Liz, you know, I'm guessing there'll be some people, you know, watching this and listening to this webinar now that may seriously be interested in some tips, some practical tips, because that they could well have a loved one who's, who is suffering at the moment. Now, let's take in your instance, it could be, you know, a young person. What, what should they be doing? I mean, can you, can you step them through what, you, what advice you would give at the moment? So if, if it's about a family member, somebody that you're worried about, particularly a young person, then it is about trying to stay connected with that person. So the dislocation, social dislocation has been very difficult, especially for young people. So to be able to communicate, have a conversation, to create the opportunities to be able to um, talk about difficult things that often young people don't want to talk about 
if you can't do it, then who is the person in, who would be the person in that person's life? Maybe it's an aunt, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's a friend. You know, what are the ways of having a conversation about it? And then trying to use the resources that we have at the moment to actually get help. There are good helplines at the moment that have been set up. Um, the Headspace sites are very good points of access for young people, which are, you know, which are now, you know, very widely available. Going to see your GP, but really encouraging the young person to talk about what the difficulties that they're having. Try and get them to get help. Um, this way up is is available at the moment. That's a very good place to start in terms of getting understanding your anxiety or issues and trying to get some help with that, and then working through that to see what further help you would need. If it's about yourself, which I think is the other kind of issue, then I think some of the things that Mike we talked about, you know, in terms of sleep and maintaining sleep, maintaining routine, it's very hard to maintain a routine when you're not going to work or you're not going to school. So making sure you get to bed at a reasonable time and you get up at the same time. People have been more active in the community, which has been great. So mm. the level of exercise has gone mm. up. I'm worried that as people get back into normal mm. life, it will drop again. And that's, I think, mm. that will be a great you know, shame because exercise is fantastic for your mental health. July is coming up, so there's always the opportunity for dry July or mostly dry July, in, as it is in our household. <laughs> so, you know, trying to reduce the amount that you drink and, you know, look at other things like yoga, exercise, meditation, things that are really important for your well being, having a project, thinking about the community around you. If you've got time, extra resources, extra food, what can you do for your community? Because resilience, when we talk about it individually, is really about the community that we live in. And this is the opportunity to strengthen some of the social connectedness with our community. Mm. Absolutely. And Mike, just um, one last question before we go over to, to some uh, questions from our, our people on the webinar. I mean, to me, there's a bit of an elephant in the room here. And you know, we just had a little bit of chat about it before we went on air. Um, as a funder with the future generation companies, you know, I, I, I didn't know much about the mental health space when we started, but I knew that we wanted to fund it because it was chronically underfunded by the private sector. And to me, it was the health issue of our time. And little did I know we were mm. going to be hit by a pandemic, which Absolutely. is going to escalate that issue. Yep. But it's, it's, to me, it's the, it's the social media. I mean, what I see with young people is a lot of instances where the use of social media is exacerbating the issue and in some cases may well be one of the key causes of their mental health distress or issues. So can you comment on that issue? Um, sure. I, I, I think that whenever we talk about digital interventions, we always talk about how scalable they are. And of course, we're always talking about the good parts of digital intervention. And I acknowledge that. I acknowledge that. How but the bad be parts are also scalable mm. uh, as well. Um, and I think that we see, unfortunately, a, a lot of the dynamics that would have been in the playground in the past have been translated online. And it can be, of course, compounded by anonymity. Uh, mm. and uh, uh, also by the, the speed with which, with which things, things mm. happen. Um, so whilst it's, uh, social media, of course, is a wonderful tool to be keeping in touch and touching base with family and friends, it, it, it does have a dark side, and it's very important that we certainly acknowledge that, that that's definitely the case. And I think whenever I think about these things that I always like to think of something as helpful or unhelpful. And Liz just lifted off, listed off a terrific list of things that are helpful <laughs> coping mechanisms for, I guess, managing our mental health and well-being. Um, and remaining connected with our family and friends is important. Um, but that does come with, uh, you know, a caution. Mm, I, I don't have kids myself. You know, I'm happily married, but I got married later in life. But I can, you know, I can imagine the struggles of, you know, social media and how much is too much and that sort of thing because I, I see it with my friends, you know, as they've as their kids have grown up. But I think that is, you know, that that's the big thing, you know, to me. I, you know, I even have a um, a sister-in-law who's become so obsessed about Instagram yes. and keeping up with yes. the Joneses that it, you know, it. it I know that I know there's been some issues there and I think wow you know like if 
far out. I think you we know. see it a lot in our clinical work, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah so. And I always say that with digital interventions, the aim's really going to be to get off of your phone and into your life, to be yeah. honest. Uh, and I think that having that, uh, having that wholeness that personal interaction has, which COVID of course has challenged fundamentally, and a true sense of belongingness is much more powerful than, uh, uh, than I think than a, a lot of, unfortunately, some of the social media interactions. Mm. All right, well, thank you. Well, look, I think we might go to questions because my view is sometimes it's the most interesting part of a session like this. And I know we've already had an interesting um, you know, dialogue already. But the first question uh, we have from one of our supporters at St Vincent's Current Foundation is, this is the international year of the nurse, of course. How does our community encourage more people to take up mental health nurses? Now, I'm not sure which one of you wants to tackle this or both, so... Um, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Go for it, Liz. It's one of the things yeah. that I am particularly passionate about. So mental health nurses are an incredibly important part of our workforce. They are highly skilled. They're used to working in teams. They work across both physical and mental health. They work across hospital systems and communities. Mm -hmm. So they have, they have great skills to deal with some of the complex issues that, that young people, older people present with. We have, a, we have a lack of mental health nurses in our community. We do not have enough. I would we, agree do not have enough funding for them. So the first thing would be to lobby the government to increase the funding. And it's good to see in the COVID package that there was greater funding for mental health nurses in aged care facilities. And that's a good thing because that was a hole, a pre-existing hole that has been filled by that. Mm. But we would like to see that available to other area to other age groups and particularly to have mental health nurses working in these kind of more complex care, multidisciplinary care that people with more persistent or severe illnesses need. So one, we need more of them. We need them to be funded properly to be able to work. And at the moment, it's quite hard to access care through mental health nurses just because their, their numbers are limited mm. and, and the numbers of people that they can take on are quite capped. So I'm lucky to work with them in the mental health nurses in the community, but it's, it's, a, it's a resource that we are sadly not utilizing enough. And, and I suppose, you know, it's, it's interesting with my day job, I, I have a podcast series and I, I interviewed David Godsky just recently, who both of you will know well, and I'm sure the, the viewers will as well. And um, one of the things that he was commenting on with this impact of COVID is how it's made him rethink about the importance of particular professions. And of course, in his case, we were talking about nurses, doctors and teachers. Uh, and how important their work is. And we had this interesting conversation about, well, um, how do we ensure that more young people are actually going into these professions? Because in the past, you know, they haven't been necessarily where, you know, the, the flavour of the month as far as where young people, you know, they might be thinking about being an accountant or whatever. So how do we, it's not just about money. I mean, I think his point was, because I was saying surely it's about money. You know, we know that teachers and nurses are not paid enough. But his point was actually about recognition and acknowledgement. So I'm interested in your thoughts. What more should we be doing, say, for nurses, mental health nurses in this instance? I mean, is there is there something else, you know? to get more people to be attracted to do these Well, jobs. I think one of the things that's happened in the UK is this, uh, it's the rainbow movement to support the NHS. And that's really a recognition by society uh, of actually uh, the wonderful work that the, the whole of the NHS has been doing to help protect their society and to maintain their society. And we're certainly seeing a version of that here. Mm. Uh, and I think that that's going to be something that's very inspirational for young people uh, in a way that we haven't seen, um, or certainly this generation hasn't seen uh, before. And I think that goes into the fact that uh, a lot of young people's experience has been that they're driven into, you know, we all need to uh, be working as hard as we can to earn as much money to have as many houses as possible. Well, suddenly that's been fundamentally challenged and uh, the whole of society is having actually to rethink what is actually important. Mm. And that's a very potent moment for people. And I hope it builds a more empathetic society. So. Mm. Liz, I'm also thinking just related to this that, 
because of all the impact of everything that's going on with COVID as well, mm. there's been a lot of talk about how, you know, people may be more interested in relocating into rural and regional centres. I mean, as I said, you know, we have a place down on the south coast. Um, so I, I understand the merits of that. Do you think it will translate into more people being willing to do that and attracted to working in rural and regional centres, say teachers and nurses, so this may help what we're talking about as well? Yeah. Or do you think maybe not in the long term? Look, I, I would hope so. Um, I would hope that it does make people think about how they work. Um, a lot of people, I think, find that they're more productive working from home and organisations find that. It's been really hard for mental health nurses. It's very true in Europe, it's true in Australia. Mental health nurses, teachers to afford to live in major cities, mm. you know, to live close mm. to work. And so I think living, you know, living in rural and regional areas, I think obviously has a lot of attraction, particularly for young families. Mm. Some of the biggest drivers of employment in those areas have been universities and tertiary education institutions. So, you know, the moving uh, tertiary education out into rural and regional areas has been really successful in some areas and that grows populations and that grows kind of health workers, teachers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot that can be done to improve the social fabric of those areas that will improve the quality of, of life for us all. And, and I, I mean, I would agree with Mike, we don't celebrate nurses, mm. teachers enough. And I have been so impressed by coming to work every day in the hospital that those people who've come to work every day through this process and also teachers, you know, the courage that they have and the dedication that they have and the sacrifices that they're willing to make is just admirable. I'm really proud to be, you know, part of that, you know, community, part of a hospital, part of a community that can do that. I mean, I, I have to admit, at the last board meeting of St Vincent's Curran Foundation, I had a serious lump in my throat and I sort of have it now when I'm talking about it. I remember uh, Anthony Chomre, the CEO of the public hospital, giving his report and making a note that, um, you know, St Vincent's nurses had helped out at Newmarch, of course, the yes, aged care did. facility. And when they asked for volunteers immediately, um, you know, they were inundated with St Vincent's nurses. And I think there were 16 nurses that, and I thought, wow, you know, it, it feels incredibly proud to be part of an organisation that's really stepping up in such a, a major way and you know hats off to to yep. to the hospitals for that i would, I would certainly agree uh, i've been very proud to be working here over this period as well uh, and i throw into the mix that we're uh, geographically located with probably the largest proportion of homeless people uh, mm. as well uh, and uh, I think we very quickly had to come to terms with the fact that we were telling people that they needed to self-isolate at home and there's a whole lot of people that didn't have a safe home to be able to self-isolate. And I think that the work that this organisation did in firstly uh, very quickly recognising that we needed to be providing intensive additional support uh, for our most, most vulnerable uh, was uh, I was extremely impressed and proud to be part of the work that that, that the organisation uh, organisation that did mm. in that area specifically in that area. Yeah, fantastic. Now, look, we might move to uh, another question here uh, from from one of our viewers, which is, how can employers help their staff who are anxious about returning to work? Now, this is a hot issue at the moment, as we're sort of, you know, we had that transition where, of course, everyone was going to work from home if you were in office situation. Mm. And of course now we're facing the other. So which one of you or both would like to comment? Sure, uh, I think that that's actually, as you say, that it's a very topical uh, subject at the moment. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, we've actually just put together a guide um, that'll be on our website, actually specifically talking about how to manage the anxiety of returning to workplace. Uh, uh, and it, we've done it as a question and answer, answer format, but it covers thing, it covers areas. It's really it's a dialogue between employers and employees at the moment uh, around maintaining safe working spaces, uh, maintaining staff cohesion, uh, managing the expectations around travelling on public transport. Uh, so uh, I certainly I would be encouraging uh, Christina to be up on our website. 
uh, probably uh, later today uh, around a specific guide uh, targeting that because uh, it, it's, it's a very poignant issue. I don't know if you want to add. Well, I, I hope we get that out to the media because I think it is a hot issue. I know in my um, workplace, the number one concern, and I'm sure this would be very common, would be public transport. Yes. So I'm, I'm fortunate that I live around the corner here from the, the campus and I walk to work in the city. Yes. So it's not an issue for me, but I, I you know, are there any, can you, can you delve into that issue a little bit more or is that, is that too much detail? But I'd, I'd love to hear your <laughs> thoughts on that because <laughs> not everyone can walk to work. Well, you know? for, for our own staff, so this is where it, it came from. Being a digital mental health service, we were very able to, act, to we, we very quickly moved to allowing people to work from home. Um, and uh, we also, uh, I guess our staff are experiencing exactly the same things that a lot of people are experiencing. So that was one of the, was the key issue that came up for us. Um, so I, I think it, it's really around, uh, uh, I guess being able to maintain the physical distancing requirements, um, being able to use some assertiveness in the way that we're able to communicate with our fellow communicators, uh, commuters if needs be, and also I think dramatically rethinking working arrangements. Uh, so it's a, a staggered start times, it's things as simple as mm -hmm. that. And I think that organisations have come to the table, and certainly this one has, around the willingness to make changes to be able to make sure their staff feel protected and supported while making these changes. So mm, Fantastic. All right, and look, one last question, uh, and I think this one's, we might direct that at you, Liz, if that's okay. I mean, what are the key warning signs um, of mental health problems in older versus younger people? Are there any significant differences? Or I mean, I think there are things that they have in common. Yes. Which is becoming more withdrawn. So that, that is true at any age. If you, if you start to become more withdrawn, not contacting friends, not staying in contact with family, spending more time on your own or more time in your room, then I think that is, a, that is always a worrying sign at, at any age, but partic partic particularly true for young people mm -hmm. and for old people who really need to stay connected. It's not so hard for in middle age where you know maybe we've got other things, and, but at those stages of life, that's really important. So I think that is a, a warning sign, not sleeping properly mm. both times. So younger people who tend who start being nocturnal, who sleeping a lot during the day and then being up a lot at night, older people whose sleep starts to get more disrupted and fragmented. Um, looking at um, you know, changes in appetite, changes in eating, changes in energy levels, and also higher rates of anxiety and distress. And there are certainly differences young women are probably better at seeking help than mm. young men young men tend to isolate themselves more probably tend to turn more to drugs and alcohol um, maybe you know more likely to get disconnected which is a worry so particularly young men I think it's important to try and stay connected with them to try and make sure that they are going out they are exercising they are doing the things that they need to do for their mental health so I, I think there are some differences between age groups. There are also a lot of things that are really in common. And we're only going to know that by actually staying connected with our family members and friends and people within the community. Um, so, and then making sure that if people do get help or if they're reluctant to get help, we stay in contact with them until we know that they're getting better, that they're doing better. Mm. So until things appear to be improving, and that's based often on what people are able to do. If they're going out, if they're walking, if they're socialising, if they're enjoying things, they're probably getting back to their normal level life again. If they're not, then that's a sign that something is not okay and we need to do something. Yeah, fantastic. All right, well look, um, I think it's been fantastic to have both of you join me today and I um, know how super super busy you are particularly in these challenging times so I want to take thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules and sharing you know with us your your expertise to to shed light on obviously these um, varying impacts of COVID but also of course as we mentioned earlier the bushfires um, etc so um, as we've heard today I mean mental health is a serious concern uh, for all Australians and of course this um, pandemic has exacerbated 
um, that issue. I mean, St Vincent's current foundation is currently raising funds uh, specifically towards their mental and our mental health uh, services, including U-Space, uh, St Vincent's private hospitals, youth mental health service, and importantly also This Way Up, St Vincent's online and tele mental health program. If you're in a position uh, to be able to support these uh, services, I'd encourage you to visit and donate towards the mental health uh, through the Foundation's website. And I'm sure um, Liz and or Mike would be very happy uh, to talk to any uh, donors or potential donors out there. Um, so or please feel free, of course, to contact uh, someone at uh, the Foundation itself. So we thank you all again for tuning in today and thanks again to Liz and Mike. Thank you.